Hi everyone, I'm Mark Mooney from TagBio. Um, presenting to you from my living room, I didn't expect to be doing this talk um, with my dog judging me silently behind me. If she appears, then you'll, you'll know why. Um, and we hope everyone is well and that um, things proceed as well as they can. So without further ado, I'll get on with my talk. Um, I'm the VP of Customer for TagBio, and what I want to talk to you today about is the TagBio data analysis platform, but also the architecture that underlies it and the intent with which we would use that platform. We're going to talk about our approach to data analysis. We're going to talk a little bit about you know, how that the underlying architecture enables a different way to analyze data, and then we'll show you some examples of customers using the, the analysis platform. When we think of how we interact with data, then we take a slightly different approach than a lot of other data analysis software, which is we view it as a conversation between the data scientist and the domain expert. We also view it as a conversation which is really a line of investigation or queries. So we see everything as being a series of questions and answers, each one corresponding and flowing uh, one after the other. So what we're going to try and do today is talk about how we can allow users to ask a series of questions and come to the answer that they want, and also to um, preserve that whole workflow and understand and go back to things that they found earlier. I think we can all agree that um, the statement that you can extract extreme value from data using the right questions is correct. I mean, it's why we're all in data analysis. Um, the problem is that nobody really arrives at the data with that perfect question. Um, the one that reveals that key answer. And so frequently what you have to do is, is ask a number of deductive questions to kind of find your way around your data set to eventually get to that key set of data or that key signal, that key answer that you can use later on. And we think that fundamentally this process is broken in that it's taking too long to ask a question, which means that the deductive questioning in itself takes too long. So the way that we, we like to see it as the last mile of data analysis is broken, and that last mile is really how you get to a data-driven decision. So given that the last mile of data analysis is broken, how do we solve that? Let me take you into TagBio's solution for bringing the elements together to enable you to ask questions much, much more quickly. So the fundamental problem with the workflow or the process at the moment is that it's really three disconnected steps, and it's often three disconnected people, or it can be. Um, you have an initial step where you're managing, organizing, cleaning, wrangling your data. You have a secondary step where you're applying algorithms to subsections of the data and you're then using those results as a, as a means to then visualize an answer that you can then send to a domain expert. And so it's very much a uh, process which is handmade. It, it solves a problem each time rather than producing a repeatable, reproducible solution. So the way that we come to this question is we try and bring those three elements together into one common underlying architecture, which we're calling a node. Um, simply a node which corresponds to data, algorithms, and a smart API. And when we think about this, and you can see it in this diagram here, what we're really looking at is enabling data to be present for an end user to question it. It's the end result. But the way that you create that is you allow data to be mapped into a node individually. So you go pick and choose the data you want, you select the way that you want to map it in, and you do it for this node. You then have an, an integration point through the algorithm side of this triangle, where you can either use algorithms that are present with, within the TagBio platform, or you can integrate R, Python, or machine learning, or AI. You could also use this as an extension into other forms of um, repetitive data use, like Hadoop, or, or other uh, forms of algorithm. And then on the other side, you have a smart API, which basically allows the node to communicate with a client or to communicate with other nodes. So what you're creating is an autonomous or an independent analysis solution present within its own architecture. Then, then the circle and the diagram indicates that that architecture, which is really quite small, can be containerized and run anywhere. So your cloud, my cloud, on-prem, your local computer. So one of the fascinating things about making a node is that the node in itself is independent. In fact, it's really the building block of everything that TagBio does. Um, we're calling them nodes. Previously, we called them flux capacitors after the Back to the Future movie. But um, it's really 
quite an, a useful solution for containing active forms of data and enabling that data to be connected. And when you connect the nodes together, they form something that has been termed a data mesh. And actually, you can see a reference to an article by Jamak Degani talking about how data nodes and the use of this kind of architecture really supersedes creating one overall binding data lake or data project to, to create the solution for everything. What we're doing is quickly pulling in data into something where you can act upon it. And so your time to value when you create a node is much faster than trying to kind of boil the ocean of all of your data and organize all of your data together. You pick the data you want and you have it ready to use. The fact that the nodes become a mesh means that you can use one node to enrich the data from another. You can use one node to monitor what the other nodes are doing. And you can start to diversify the function of a node. And they become, it's almost for a biologist, it's a model like multicellularity, where the cells that may be individual become specialized when you make a multicellular organism or a data mesh. If you've made a mesh, <laughs> which leads to lots of, um, once you've made your mesh, and mesh, not mess, then you have the data organized into these discrete groups that you be can begin to work with. But discrete groups scattered around in various clouds in various locations are not really that helpful. So the way that you make them usable and you make them actionable is you bring them together and you put them in an analysis portal. So when we're going to look at the software, what you're actually seeing is not a piece of software, but it's an, a kind of container software within which you hang each node that you've created. And these nodes can be disparate. Um, they can be uh, from all ranges of data within life sciences and healthcare for our example, but they can actually go further than that. It's really a way of grouping a data set with its specific apps or questions that you're asking it and allowing it to be present for someone to point and click their way through a, co a complex question. So let's recap and we can, we can see how we're building a different kind of structure. You have your fundamental building block node, data algorithms API or data integration API. And then you have your network of connected nodes called a mesh. And then you focus that mesh through an analysis portal. Um, and that allows you to start having a very different data experience. So let's look at how this data experience varies. The fundamental thing that we do, I think, that's different than other kinds of software is we're really focused around questions and questions leading to an investigation. So if we look at what a question looks like, from the domain expert point of view, um, they come into a web browser, they come to the, 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 they sign in, they see all of the data nodes available to them, they pick one. And so they pick data, and in this case we're going to demonstrate some oncology data. Um, they go in, they click on the data tile, they come directly to the apps that then ask that data a question. They go in, they parameterize their question, they press run, and they can only press run when they parameterize to a certain extent and they press run and they come back to an answer. And you can see within the demonstration and you'll see within the software that as you make your question, it's created for you on one side of the screen. And when you come to your answer, your question is repeated for you. The most important thing for anyone investigating data is that they feel confident that they've asked the right question and that their results are sensible and logical. So when you've done that and you've gone through asking a question, Maybe this leads you to ask another question or ask a chain of questions or go to another data set and do something compar comparable and then bring the two together. You're really creating this chain of questions which becomes a history. And one of the things that we've done, which I think is quite important, is to take that history and make it instantly replayable. So part of the fact that you have everything connected in nodes, those nodes are connected in meshes, and you have provenance for the questions that you're asking and the answers you're getting, is that you can make a history of all of your actions and the history within the, um, the portal allows you to go back to anything you did at any previous time and not only replay it for yourself but share it with other people. And this is a really important thing because um, as we discussed at the beginning, data science shouldn't be something that you do on your own and tell yourself the answer. It's really about driving decisions based on data and so you want to come to a data-driven decision, then show it to someone else, confirm with them, work forward, and get, come to the best decision you can. So let me show you an example of this in the next slide. And here you can see that uh, user one, um, in this case represented by our domain expert, 
is going through and she's analyzing a data set, a omic data set of single cell data. And so she will make a cohort, uh, run an analysis on that cohort, find out something interesting about its gene expression, and then extract from that list of differential gene expression a particular signature that she's interested in. And for us, this idea of um, not only asking a question, getting an answer, but then making an extracted signal or an, an artifact has been codified into our idea that you, um, you're actually, the whole process of data analysis is about making useful data artifacts. And these things are the pieces of information that you believe represent something in the underlying biology that you would use in another data set. So here, um, our domain expert has made a gene signature, and she can then pass it to a data scientist who's working on some analysis for bulk tissue. And that data scientist can take that gene signature and run it across their bulk tissue and see whether it makes logical sense, if, it, if it's producing the same kind of results that they would have expected, or if it's producing something different. And one of the nice things about this is you can perform section one and section two almost in real time. I mean, we're, when we look at single cell experiments, I can get to, uh, I could select and create a gene signature in under, under five minutes. I can pass that and share that instantly with someone else in the platform, exactly the analysis I did. And then they can take everything and just move forward it, with it again in real time. So a lot of the problems which happen because it takes so long to ask a question, you get a very limited number of them, go away when you can iterate really quickly. And it's really that difference between having a series of still images and looking at a movie. So if we can do um, the flow that I just showed you in diagrammatic form, then how does this really apply in real life? And so these, this is the next section where I want to talk to you about how this has actually worked for people doing data investigation. So our first example is a collaboration with someone called Dr. Milan Radovich from IUPUI. And I had worked with Milan many years before, and um, I knew that he was working on oncology data. We'd been working with the Cancer Genome Atlas data sets and putting them up into instances. And we needed a, re a reviewer to just tell us whether the data sets were making sense, whether they, they made sense in the way that we presented them. So we contacted Milan, had a meeting. Uh, we said we've been working on TCGA. He pointed at one of the data sets, which is Thymoma, and said, uh, yeah, actually, that's my data set. I published it in 2018. Great, you know, that means if you've published this data set, you are the best person to tell us about what it means and how, whether it's being represented sensibly. So we gave him access to an instance, which is really a fairly simple procedure where I just grant someone credentials, they go to a website, log in, and it's there. And then he was able to click on the Thymoma data tile and run the analysis apps that were related to Thymoma and the other TCGA data sets. Um, three or four days later, I got an email from Milan saying, it looks fine. Um, we should publish a poster for AACR. I instantly wrote back, yes, we should definitely publish a poster for AACR. And I had no idea what we were going to publish it about. Um, and what we found was that Milan, over the course of one evening, had actually gone in and found three different insights relating to data that he had already published because he could access the data in a different way and then analyze it and review it very quickly. And so that really shows, I think, that there is something about being able to iterate on questions. There is a, there is a fact that you can, you can go in and, and organize and look at the data quickly enough to follow a line of argument or follow a line of thought. We wrote the poster. Um, the three conclusions were the presence of an autoantigen from myasthenia gravis in thymoma, um, a re revelation of a, a tumor suppressor gene through copy number change, and then um, another gene that was involved in tumor metastasis was also revealed in some of the population. So three quite interesting insights from a data set that had already been published um, that you, you, know, you might consider to have been used or, or done. If there are three interesting insights in Thymoma, there are over 120 data sets at the CBIO portal um, website where you could go in and you could probably do the same thing. And with that in mind, we've uploaded all of the TCGA single data sets and the pan-cancer analysis. And we've also overlaid the immune landscape of cancer data onto the pan-cancer analysis. So all of these things are ready to be used and to be investigated by people who would like to come in and do this kind of investigative questioning. To show the range of the platform, we're gonna now process through another customer experience, another user experience, 
um, but in a different area. So moving from research to clinical trials, um, we've been working with a large a global pharma and looking at how do we take clinical trial results present in a SAS format and then coordinate them and bring them together so that you can cross compare either st arms within the same study or different studies and look at possible correlations between responder groups in one study and another. And so we've completed this and what it's really turning into is a way of kind of creating a workflow that says I have this group as my background, I have these group as my responders, show me what's correlation, what correlations occur with my responder group. And there is no reason why that format of data mapping and integration and then the, the, the way that you can work towards those answers about responders uh, wouldn't apply to anyone else's clinical, clinical trial work. And the last example present, we'll present here is really the, the complete other end from research. So it's the actual application of healthcare and its use within the population today. So we've been working with UCSF. We actually evolved from a group, uh, from, from work that was done initially in the oncology group at UCSF. And um, we've continued that relationship into the relationship we have with the UCSF Med Center. And here, we're looking at nine years of Med Center billing data, and we've created an instance with analysis apps and data sets that are particularly suited and written and created so that doctors can ask questions about the value-driven healthcare. And the person we collaborate with at UC the UCF Med Center is Dr. Jahan Fahimi, who's a, again, a superb individual for collaboration. And Jahan has run over 2,000 analyses in three months. We're rolling this out across um, UCSF. And we're in fact working on similar projects, in fact, more relevant projects with UCSD uh, as we speak. So there are three different forms of data, uh, data analysis shown in those examples. So one, pure research, biomarker discovery, uh, using uh, both bulk tissue, we can also show you an example around single cell. Um, you've got some examples around clinical trials and how you would take that information, that more limited information and more controlled. And then something really about you know, the day-to-day -day mechanics of, of healthcare in a hospital. And the system, because of the nodes and the fact that each node can be extremely uh, focused on the data that it contains, can work for all three kinds of data. So you have a platform built upon nodes, nodes arranged into a mesh. Those nodes can deal with almost any data type and you are then able to begin to use this. First, if anything that you saw during this demo sparks your interest, then please contact us at info at tag.bio. So thank you for your attention and thank you for staying with us throughout this whole time.